Thanks for joining us today. My name's Ewan Saunders. Uh, today I'm joined by Ali Kadri. Ali is the president of Holland Park Mosque and he's joining us today uh, for a conversation about the issues that we've been speaking a lot about lately. Rise in nationalism, the rise in anti Islam sentiment uh, amongst politicians, amongst media and in other circles. Thanks for joining us today, Ali. Thank you, Yuan. Uh, so I've heard of an imam of a mosque, uh, but I haven't heard of a, of a president of a mosque. What exactly do you do in your role? Well, it's not as good as being a president of the United States, for sure, but uh, <laughs> president of mosque is uh, president of the association, which basically owns the property and uh, does all day-to-day -day management of the mosque. So uh, I'm basically elected president of the incorporated association which owns and manages the mosque. Okay, cool. And um, how would you describe your role in the Muslim community in broader terms? Because I, I, I know you don't just do things associated with the mosque. You, uh, you, you're very much uh, in the media a, a, a fair bit. Uh, how would you describe your role in relation to the Muslim community and the broader Australian community? I think that... Uh, the role of a president traditionally has, uh, has been different to what's been happening recently and that's mainly because of the current political uh, and um, I guess uh, international political climate in the world. And um, you know traditionally a, a president of the mosque would only be bothered with the mosque and day-to-day -day management but nowadays it's more about communicating with the other community, uh, you know talking through media, uh, opening the doors of the mosque and doing much more social and I guess political role than uh, just a traditional president role. So it has changed dramatically and that's in response to the, uh, the issues which we face currently. So um, if I only got my information from mainstream media sources, I, I think I'd probably have the impression that Muslims are a fairly homogenous lot, um, a fairly conservative, adhering to strict religious rules. Uh, the impression is a, a, of, a, like I said, a very homogenous uh, group of people and community across the country. First of all, how big is Australia's Muslim community and, and how accurate are those sorts of stereotypes? Look, there are about half a million Muslims in Australia and um, uh, those stereotypes are completely incorrect because Muslim community is very diverse. I guess it's as diverse as Australia itself. I mean, you know, Muslims come from uh, different, uh, I guess, political setups, different social and cultural sort of setups. And uh, as far as conservatism is concerned, uh, you know, that varies as well from different, I guess, ethnic groups, different cultural groups and uh, different experiences and different generations. So, you know, you traditionally find people coming from a certain area being more conservative in their interpretation of Islam compared to others. And uh, that also varies across the board from the generation to generation. So, you know, your first generation would be a little more conservative than the second and third and so on and so forth. So it's a very diverse group and, and, and you know, to assume that Muslims are homogeneous is, is, is completely wrong. It's incorrect. So now to something that's happened quite recently that I think a lot of Australians found quite disturbing and this was the, the, the arson attack on the Toowoomba Mosque. Um, could you tell me a little bit about that, what kind of impact it had on the Muslim community and, and what was the response of the broader community as well? Look, uh, Muslim community as a whole right now feels under siege. I mean, you know, the political rhetoric, the media, the newspapers, every day, every hour somebody is speaking about Muslims. And for such a small minority uh, in, in a country of 23 million, so much political attention, so much media attention creates a sense of, you know, sort of siege mentality. So there is that fear in the Muslim community and that gets topped up by events like attack on the mosque and mosque being burned down. So that just, you know, reinstates the, the view in a lot of Muslims that, uh, you know, we are not a full citizen of this country, we are targeted, we are a, and, and a feeling of being a persecuted sort of minority in the country. Now the wider community, yes, you know, there are people who are who understand that uh, there's a lot of politics behind uh, all this rhetoric and uh, they do come out and support uh, the community. But unfortunately, they, their voice is not as loud as uh, right-wing extremists or our media and politicians. So, um, Tony Abbott recently came out in his national security statement uh, saying that Muslim leaders needed to condemn terrorism, condemn extremism and mean it. Um, 
So given that Muslim leaders have actually been some of the most vocal in, in condemning religious extremism, uh, what do you think was really behind the Prime Minister's comments? Once again, the political rhetoric, dog whistle politics, you know, he wants to attract the votes from the right-wing extremists. Right-wing extremists like to hear these kind of rhetoric from the politicians and uh, he's just buying into it. I mean, the whole idea of um, cancelling citizenships is basically legalizing the right-wing rhetoric of go back where you came from. So, you know, Prime Minister is just playing dog whistle politics, nothing else. So the laws that are being proposed, and we haven't even seen a lot of detail on them around cancelling people's citizenship or, or sending people back to uh, or over to another country that they may have dual citizenship of, uh, has raised a lot of eyebrows and a lot of concern, uh, but it's not the first seemingly authoritarian type legislation that we've come across in recent times. What do you think is the relationship between this rhetoric coming from politicians and the media apparatus and the, the increase in what many would say are authoritarian laws? I think, look, government, as I said again, uh, government wants to be seen tough on uh, on extremism and it uh, and that is why I think they're not serious about solving this problem of extremism because their laws are actually adding to the root cause which is alienation and marginalization which causes extremism in turn. So I don't think government is serious. Uh, government wants sees this as an opportunity to divert the uh, attention from failed economic policies. We are, um, you know, our exports are falling. Uh, we have, as a country, we are economically in, in a lot of trouble. And if there was nothing to be scared of, then everybody would start talking about economic policies and that wouldn't go down very well for the Liberal Party or for the ruling coalition. And um, that is why they're doing this. So, um, when a community has its very right to exist challenged and, and when that's under attack, uh, um, I guess it's, it's a difficult thing for people to deal with. So. Um, what does a community do in those circumstances when they are under attack where they do feel like they're being treated as second class or non-citizens, uh, even people who have been born and grown up in this country? What's been the response of uh, everyday uh, individuals in the Muslim community and the Muslim community as a, as a group, I guess, within... Uh, uh, not that I'm saying it's a single homogenous group, of course, but um, has there been a general response? What sort of response have you seen? I don't think there's a general response because a lot of people don't know how to react and how to, even community leaders, don't know how to react to these kind of uh, rhetoric and these kind of laws. But, uh, you know, I've seen some groups um, getting more alienated and, uh, you know, sort of thinking of um, basically leaving the country for good on their own. There are some who uh, feel that there is a political solution to this problem and that is by political lobbying. There are others who believe that um, there's nothing they can do and they'll live with it. So, you know, di there are different responses, but nobody has got a coherent response on how to deal with these kind of situ situation because, as, as I said before, you know, we are a very small minority in this country and uh, the focus on us, the political games which are played on our uh, with our name and using us as scapegoat are too big for us to understand and, and too uh, too big for us to do something about. So Reclaim Australia, So, from what I've been able to gather the people behind it are uh, far right wing micro parties, uh, neo-Nazi organisations even and even bizarrely I think the uh, the far right of uh, the Christian churches, in particular the, the Catch the Fire ministries, who have had their own share of controversy. Um, what do you know about Reclaim Australia? Well, uh, to me, they're, they're all, uh, I guess, uh, once again, a diverse group of haters united on, a, on, on one cause, using Muslims as scapegoat to push their ideas, which basically are very much against the uh, the liberal, I guess, ideology or, or democratic values of Australia. And uh, they are once again using the fear there is out there, created by the media and political rhetoric, to push their own agenda. So uh, that's where they are coming from. And, uh, you know, I, I hope they don't get more traction than they've got, because uh, they, like any other extremists, are very dangerous for a free society. 
So now that groups like Reclaim Australia have gained the confidence to organise publicly, to have rallies and so on, uh, what do you think, uh, I guess, what do you have to say to um, listeners and viewers about what we as a community ought to be doing? And I'm, I'm sure everyone's got their own ideas, but what are yours? <laughs> I think it's as simple as communicating and getting yourself educated. I mean, you know, if you are uh, afraid of something, the best thing to do is to actually find out more about it, whether you should be afraid or not. And uh, I think living in fear is not a good idea. And by getting afraid and threatening others, we are actually creating a society which is very dark and sad for its citizens. So the solution is simple, is to communicate and talk to each other. Ali Hadri, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Yuan. Thanks, man. And thank you, and we'll see you on next week's program.